And that, in the largest sense, is the theme of this book. The retreat from liberalism and the rise in the professional middle class of a meaner, more selfish outlook, hostile to the aspirations of those less And that, in the fortunate. largest sense, is the theme of this if book. If the focus on one the class the retreat from liberalism and the rise in the professional middle class of a meaner, more selfish outlook, hostile to the aspirations of those less in the I was trying to play the introduction of this audiobook I'm about to read, just like a few minutes of it, but I think I got some audio feedback issue for, for a second, but I'm going to keep playing and step away, and then I'll do an audio-assisted reading, but good morning, everybody. Welcome to this audio-assisted reading. I'm David McCarricker, and this is Theory Underground. Tonight launches the first of a series of lectures by yours truly and Elton LK of Working Class Intelligentsia podcast. We're going to be lecturing on the concept and category of the PMC. So really excited uh, to do this exegetical audiobook excerpt with you all here. But before I get started, I'm going to play a little bit more of uh, the introduction while I get set up. Narrow. I would point out that most books, and especially those which make large claims about the American character and culture, are in fact about this class and about it alone. We are told periodically that Americans are becoming more self-involved, materialistic, spineless, or whatever, when actually only a subgroup of Americans is meant. People who are more likely to be white-collar professionals lawyers, middle managers, or social workers, for example, than machinists or sales clerks. Usually, this limitation goes without mention. For in our culture, the professional and largely white middle class is taken as a social norm, a bland and neutral mainstream from which every other group or class is ultimately a kind of deviation. Consider one of the great popular sociological endeavors of the last three decades, The Lonely Crowd. In this wonderfully imaginative, wide-ranging book, David Riesman purported to demonstrate a deep change in the American character, a decline, one might say, of inner discipline and will. Only well into the book does the reader discover that many millions of Americans, the members of the blue-collar working class, are exempt from this characterological change, or immune, as the author puts it. No one seems to have thought this omission strange, though clearly Riesman's crowd was far lonelier than it needed to have been. Many other familiar and important books about the American experience and character turn out to be entries into the swelling biography of the middle class. The feminine mystique, for all its role in inspiring the feminist revival, was not about women, but about college-educated suburban women married to doctors, executives, psychiatrists. The greening of America depicted only the greening of the white-collar crowd and their student young the blue-collar working class again being immune, or in this case, past saving. Habits of the Heart, a chronicle of moral numbness and declining public spirit, is again, and by the author's honest admission. And I hate to cut it off there, but I can't just play this forever. I do want to get to the reading. What you were listening to was the an excerpt from the introduction to Barbara Ehrenreich's Fear of Falling, which can be found on Audible. That's uh, where I got that. And the reason I wanted to play that before jumping in is so you kind of get an idea. Yes, this is, this is, uh, Barbara Ehrenreich is a leftist activist, union organizer, and uh, one of the founding members of the DSA back in the 70s, I think. And her concern was that the progressive fixation on oppression um, through the traditional race, gender, age, you know, queer categories um, had completely lost touch with working class constituencies. And so whenever people were talking about these things, they were really talking about these um, these identities and the experiences of middle-class Americans and therefore the organizers of the DSA and of the unions 
we're often um, assuming the, their middle class values and their sort of PMC well, approach, worldview, mindset, and mode. Um, assuming all of this baggage without really realizing what they were doing and how it fosters resentment in the lives of work, regular working class people. And the point is not to foster resentment, but to understand how um, this stuff gone unacknowledged necessarily fosters a resentment. You could say it fosters an ancient antagonism. And so uh, she was using class in its looser sense at the beginning of this. Next week, we'll be doing the essay where she actually uh, shows that you, even going with traditional Marxist categories, if you are to update them, um, the, the Marxist definition of class would have to be updated to match the current conditions. And that's a, a lot more of a theoretical treatise. This, she's approaching it for normies and she's just talking about it as group interests, which is the more sociological usage that some people find problematic. It's the way that W.E.B. Du Bois also uses the word class. For instance, he would call African, African Americans a class. Um, that definition of class is really uh, any time that there's a group that has its own interests that are antagonistic to other groups' interests, then they just call it a class. Um, she uses the two interchangeably here because she's her approach is a broad umbrella that is supposed to um, work for every theory of class, really, because it doesn't really matter what your theory of class is going to be you still have to consider what she's talking about here. And the ancient antagonism that we're going to be getting into here, this section of the text that Elton L. K. of Working Class Intelligentsia podcast wanted everybody to have to read after his lecture tonight, is what I will be reading. And it is, what was I going to say about what I was going to be reading? Um... Well, I, I'm glad that he picked this excerpt. I think that it's one of the most important. I'll just leave it at that. Um, so let's dive in. For anybody who really didn't want to have to sit and read this through, or at least on the first pass, this is to you. You can play Tetris or drive your truck to work or, you know, be moving stuff around in a warehouse. Whatever it is that you're doing, we're trying to make this accessible for people who won't be able to sit and turn pages. An ancient antagonism. But working class hostility toward the middle class was not the bitter product of one turbulent decade. To the working class, the professional middle class is an elite. Money is only part of its perceived advantage. The other difference, which middle class people have traditionally not liked to acknowledge, arises from the division of labor between the two classes. People in both classes must work for a living, but as John Kenneth Galbraith has observed, all work is not the same. For most people, meaning working class people, work is fatiguing or monotonous, or at a minimum, a source of no particular pleasure. Only in the professional middle class is work seen and often experienced as intrinsically rewarding, creative, and important. But to admit the difference, Galbraith argued, would be to acknowledge a deep and disquieting inequality. Quote, in both capitalist and communist societies, it serves the democratic conscience of the more favored groups to identify themselves with those who do hard physical labor. A lurking sense of guilt over a more pleasant, agreeable, and remunerative life can often be assuaged by the observation, I am a worker too. The difference, end quote, the difference, though, goes deeper than comfort. It is more fundamentally a difference defined by an, by an inequality of power. Relative to the working class, the holders of middle class occupations are in positions of command, or at the very least, authority. Their job is to conceptualize in broad terms what others must do. The job of the worker, blue or pink collar, is to get it done. The fact 
that this is a relationship of domination and grudging submission is usually invisible to the middle class, but painfully apparent to the working class. As auto worker John Lippert wrote in discussing the hostility of his co-workers to college-educated leftists, quote, in the experience of most people in the plants, colleges train people, for example, teachers, social workers, engineers, to do one thing, to keep the workers in line. Historically, the antagonism between the classes is as old as the professional middle class itself and stems from the fact that one of the purposes of the modern professions was in fact to keep the workers in line. The period from roughly 1870 to 1920 in which the professions took shape and the professional middle class emerged was also a period of violent clashes between the working class and its traditional antagonist, the capitalist class. In strike after strike, from the coal fields of Tennessee to the mines of Colorado to the mills of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I say, my God, workers confronted the armed power of capital or its proxy, the National Guard. In the 1880s, the Knights of Labor, with 700,000 members, declared that the attitude of the order to the existing industrial system is necessarily one of war. In the 1900s, the revolutionary industrial workers of the world attracted a million members, and the Socialist Party's Eugene V. Debs won 900,000 votes in the presidential election of 1912. Throughout this period, the knee-jerk capitalist response was repression, armed guards to break strikes, beatings, jailings, and lynchings to crush the militant leadership of the working class. And lynchings, by the way, I, I wanted to highlight here, obviously in a lot of cases were racial, but also Jim Crow and other forms of segregation were a professionalist, progressive, paternalist, racist ideal um, being put on people. And uh, that was arguably being done as a reaction to black and white uh, farmers, miners, and workers uh, combining forces in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, there's an essay about that in the work called Renewing Black Intellectual Life. Um, it's worth checking out. I think it's by... I don't want to say her name because I'm going to mess it up. But I think it's Judith Stein. But... Um, I did do an assisted reading of it a couple years ago, and I will re-release that in the future someday. Anyway, yeah, this whole period of how the United States structured itself to um, get out ahead of and undermine working class organization is something that is absolutely essential to understand how um, our conditions that we find ourselves in today are fundamentally different than the conditions that were being written about or observed or responded to by political strategists and theorists of the 18, 19, and 20th centuries who might have been in, say, Europe or Russia. The emerging professional middle class stepped into the fray in the role of peacemakers. Their message to the capitalists was the nonviolent social control would be in the long run be more effective than bullets and billy clubs. Mines and mills did not have to be hotbeds of working class sedition. They could be run more smoothly by trained scientific managers. Working class families did not have to be perpetual antagonists to capitalist society. They could be Americanized by teachers and social workers and eventually seduced by admin and marketing experts. Almost every profession or would-be profession, from sociology to home economics, had something to offer in the great task of taming the American working class. And you know, obviously, uh, consumerism became a big part of that, and the, the sort of uh, white picket fence vision of the American dream was rolled out by marketing firms as part of this effort. The professionals' stance as neutral mediators barely concealed their own class interests. In the progressive era, ideology of the professional middle class, all social problems could be transformed into 
technical problems, and technical problems could only be solved by expanding the new class of professional experts. As historian and reformer Frederick Jackson Turner explained in 1910, it was necessary to train a huge cadre of administrators, legislators, judges, and experts, who shall disinterestedly and intelligently mediate between contending interests. The most dangerous conflict, and the greatest challenge for the new experts, was the conflict between workers and capitalists. Quote, When the word capitalist classes and the proletariat can be used and understood in America, it is surely time to develop such men with the ideal of service to the state who may help to break the force of these collisions. End quote. Uh, Black G.V. Gar... <laughs> uh, commenter uh, saying, I've nailed the teaching grandma look. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm going for here. Actually, it's just cold today, and so that's why I'm wearing this. This is a grandma. Come on. It's like a flannel. It's like a wooly, nice, warm flannel. Get out of here. Someone should have told me that the screen is a little cut off here. Come on, Nance. Okay, I fixed it. There we go. Carrying on. And in 1907, Edward A. Ross, one of America's first sociologists, advocated social engineering to control class conflict, warning that it might soon be necessary to turn over the defense of society to professionals. Professionals, of course, cost money. In salaries for professional managers and engineers, in charitable contributions to welfare agencies, in public expenditures for teachers... But the ultimate decision of American capitalists as they moved into the 20th century was, to put it somewhat crudely, that a cadre of professionals was cheaper than an army of Pinkertons. The profession of management was born on the front lines of the, 20th century, the early 20th century battle between labor and capital, and its story illustrates the tensions between the working class and the emerging middle class. Since the story has been so well told elsewhere, I will be recklessly brief. Until the early 20th century, there was no profession of management, or for that matter, of engineering. The reason, as a virtual inventor of scientific management, Frederick Taylor later observed ruefully, was that the shop was really run by the workmen and not by the bosses. Manual and, mentor, manual and mental labor had not yet been sorted into distinct occupations. Skilled craftsmen dominated both the, techno the technology and the organization of the work process. This left the employer in the vexing situation of being unable to comprehend or control the labor he paid for. Only the workers could judge, for example, how long a given job should take, and hence how much they should be paid. Taylor's contribution was to show how the intellectual command of the production process could be stripped from the workers and concentrated in a more reliable cadre of middle-class managers and engineers. Through a careful analysis of the production process, the complex and intellectually demanding work of the craftsmen could be broken down into simple repetitive motions to be divided among less skilled workers. Henceforth, no mere worker would be able to comprehend or control the entire process. Each would be reduced to a few repetitive motions, such as turns of a wrench. Meanwhile, the manager or engineer armed with a stopwatch now oversaw the work process, determining who, de determining who would do what and, crucially, how fast it should be done. Henry Ford's assembly line sealed the new division of labor into the hard steel of heavy machinery. America's working class began to be transformed into an army of wrench turners required neither to think nor to create. In fact, usually required not to think or create. The creative functions, such as designing new products, were removed from the shop floor to the engineer's workstation. The day-to-day decision-making was lifted into the clean and quiet offices of management. This rationalization of production did not succeed in taming the working class, which rose up with a new burst of militants in the 1930s. 
but it did greatly enhance the day-to-day -day power of employers over their blue-collar hirelings, while, not incidentally, providing employment for growing numbers of educated white-collar men. Outside of the industrial workplace, other professions consolidated themselves by offering to mediate class conflict or by usurping skills that had belonged to the working class. Social workers and teachers provided invaluable services to the urban poor, but in an ideological context that stressed Americanization, which means patriotism as opposed to class or ethnic identity, and middle-class gen gentility, gentility, or as they insisted on calling it, right living. Medicine achieved its professional monopoly in part through a campaign to discredit and outlaw indigenous healers, especially midwives, who had played a key role in every ethnic working class community. Remember, I brought that up last night because that's a nice uh, tie-in to the other reading, uh, the excerpt by Thomas Frank. This was a dubious reform since as late as 1910, midwives were achieving lower rates of stillbirths and maternal mortality than the professional physicians who sought to eliminate them. Public health officials introduced the sanitary measures that eventually curbed epidemics and infectious diseases, but they also incurred lower class resentment by their heavy handed policing of immigrant ghettos. Today, few people retain any active memory of these historical insults to the working class, but resentment persists in the form of the common perception that middle class professionals and managers don't really do anything, certainly nothing that justifies their superior pay and status. Middle class functions like supervision and management and even conceptualization and innovation are shadowy undertakings at best. To workers who may feel justifiably that they would be more productive without so much professional and managerial interference, middle class occupations are likely to look like scams for avoiding real work. This was, in fact, the first lesson I was given as a child of upwardly mobile working class parents about the class our family aspired to join. My father, who had been a gandy dancer for the Union Pacific Railroad and a copper miner in Butte, Montana, could not say the word doctor without the virtual prefix quack. Lawyers were shysters, as in shyster lawyer, and professors were, without exception, phonies. These judgments were cynical and confusing, since my father's life strategy had been to escape backbreaking manual labor by joining the ranks of the quacks and the phonies. Later, as an adult, I asked him if these attitudes had been common among his co-workers and drinking companions in Butte in the 40s. Yes, of course, he said, because everyone could see the doctors, see that doctors, lawyers, and white-collar managers didn't do a goddamn thing, yet got paid better than the men who daily risked their lives in the mines. In interviews with blue-collar chemical workers conducted in the late 70s and early 80s, David Hall found the same universal judgment— it is only workers who actually work. Consider this exchange. Researcher. Are lawyers working men? Worker. No, they don't really work. They just sit and hire people who do the work. Researcher. Are big businessmen working men? Worker. Of course not. They just sit on their butts all day. And I would just interject that Fox News and Rush Limbaugh, may he rest in hell, um, both of the, you know, Fox, Fox and Rush Limbaugh, basically conservative news for the last 50 years has tried its hardest to get some workers to see no difference between themselves and these big business working, these big businessmen. The, the goal of Fox and Tucker Carlson and uh, Rush Limbaugh is to, to be like, yeah, um, you digging the ditch? You're a hard worker who's who's doing the right things, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Same with Elon Musk. You're both like in the same boat here, trying to create that feeling of solidarity. But anyway, worker, of course not. They, the big businessmen, just sit on their butts all day. Researcher, am I, professor, a working man? Worker, bitterly, no, you're not a working man. You don't breathe in all these fumes, all these chemicals and shit. Sociologists Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb encountered the same resentment in their research for the hidden injuries of class, describing the obstacles to their study 
They reported, quote, Trust was finally established when people felt they could express anger to us about the barriers they felt between people in our class and theirs. You mean, Dick, a plumber said to Richard Sennett, you mean you make a good living just by sitting around and thinking? By what right? Now, don't take this personally. I mean, I'm sure you're a very smart fellow and all that, but that's really the life, not having to break your balls for someone else. End quote. It is not only the middle class professionals. It is not only that middle class professionals appear not to work. What work they do often takes the form of harassing those below them. Consider this account of a shop floor encounter from Mike Lefevre, Lefevre a steel worker interviewed by Studs Terkel. Quote, This one foreman I've got, he's a kid, he's a college graduate. He thinks he's better than everybody else. He was chewing me out and I was saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, what do you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah? Yes, sir. I told him, who the hell are you, Hitler? What is this yes, sir bullshit? I came here to work. I didn't come here to crawl. There's a fucking difference. End quote. As a consequence of his assertiveness, a quality prized among professionals but regarded as a bad attitude in most blue, blue and pink collar work situations, Lefevre reported he got broke down to a lower grade and lost 25 cents an hour, which is a hell of a lot. Similar experiences produced the kind of bitterness expressed by a 41-year-old garment worker interviewed by Sandy Carter. Quote, I know they, technical and managerial employees, do work, but they don't work like I do. They keep their eye on us. They make sure that everything runs smooth, but we're the ones who do the production. They're just here to make sure we do it like they want. Or this from a young steel worker. As far as I'm concerned, I got no use for the intellectual, the so-called expert who sits around all day dreaming up new ways to control my life. Outside the workplace, the class conflict continues. How, after all, do working class people with their supposedly limited range of associations encounter the professional middle class? Not in most cases as friends or co-workers, but in the role of teachers, social workers, or physicians. All of these are helping professions, full of generous spirited people, but they are also roles that confer authority and the power to make judgments about others. The teacher will determine whether your child's difficulties stem from a behavior problem, a learning disability, or a simple lack of effort. The social worker, who may have vastly different notions of what constitutes normal family life, will scrutinize and diagnose your intimate problems. The physician will pass judgments on your habits and lifestyle. He or she will very likely also treat you, if you are a poor working class patient, in an unconsciously patronizing or condescending manner. No wonder, then, that in Senate and Cobbs' study, working class respondents felt that an educated upper middle class person was in a position to judge them, and that the judgment rendered would be that working class people could not be respected as equals. For working class people, relations with the middle class are usually a one-way dialogue. From above come de commands, diagnoses, instructions, judgments, definitions, even through the media, suggestions as to how to think, feel, spend money, and relax. Ideas seldom flow upward to the middle class because they are simply no there are simple there are, there are simply no structures to channel the upward flow of thought from class to class. Graduate school courses do not invite ordinary people to speak to class to classes of professionals in training. Managers, outside of experiments in improving the quality of work life, do not solicit new approaches from their subordinates. Members of the helping professions seldom invite suggestions or criticism from their clients, especially clients perceived as lower class. There is simply no way for the working class or poor person to capture the attention of middle class personnel without seeming rude or insubordinate. In the imposed silence of working class life, hostility thrives. As a 46-year-old mother of three, diagnosed as suffering from a character disorder, said of her social worker, God, I hate that woman. She makes me feel so stupid. Seems like everything that I do is wrong. The way I am with my kids, with my husband, even my sex life. She knows it all. Personally, I think her ideas are a little screwed up but I can't tell her that. Yeah, 
Um, just want to insert here that, and if I don't insert enough, then this isn't really an exegesis, is it? But the reason I think that this is also important is because there's never been a mass working class movement that did not sympathize with, in some way here, and integrate these feelings of resentment. There's a way, I'm sure, there has to be a way to do it without just leaning in to resentment and making resentment everything that you're doing. But you don't ignoble the scorned human dignity that has to survive under these conditions of domination. You don't just, you don't, uh, uh, you're just resentful. Uh. And to call uh, PMC theory or critique or analysis nothing more than fostering resentment when it has always been a way of trying to understand an already existing resentment and antagonism seems foolish and foolhardy to me. Nance is driving. What's up, Nance? Driving. What's up, everybody? I hope that you're having a great time getting settled in uh, to a relaxing day where you are not being forced to break your back for somebody who's breathing down your neck, telling you what to do and to speed it up and a bunch of bullshit that's not their business. Um, uh, but if you are working, then I'm so glad that you're able to listen to this while at work. That's awesome. And uh, if you're just playing video games or chilling or driving or whatever, then it's great to have you. I'm drinking my coffee. I'm looking at the beautiful, beautiful view out this window. Um, I am in Mexico, and this is the first time in my entire life that I've had a couple of months ahead of me with no regular um, commodified labor obligations. Yeah, first time. And it's the first time that I've had a place to myself without roommates or without my tiny house being on the premises of other people who determine whether or not I can live there and kind of what the rules are and all these other kinds of things. And so um, in a lot of ways, this is the most free I've ever felt and I still don't know how to feel about it and it's weird but uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Nan says, I think I realized I struggle to take this argument seriously because a lot of the current post left misappropriate it to justify red-brown bullshit. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I don't know who the fuck the post left is or how they appropriate this stuff. But, uh... It, it's weird to think that this could be used to justify red-brown bullshit, which, by the way, folks, is like communists need to work together with Nazis. That, that's the red-brown bullshit. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I don't know anybody who's making those arguments. I kind of... Um, there was one person on YouTube who got a little uh, cynical, and I'd been talking with her and uh, I think maybe she was headed in that direction but I'm not sure so it's, I really don't know and she doesn't exist on the internet anymore anyway so I don't know I just don't know I keep asking people who's this post left that I hear about and uh, I don't know who they are or where they are I, unless everyone's just talking about Amy Therese which is like okay fair enough maybe, maybe that's what she does but I haven't really listened to her the delusion of knowing it all is more than an individual failing. The structure of the professions with their steep educational barriers seems to assure that no outsider has anything to offer. The autodidact, the talented amateur, have been so thoroughly excluded that the possibility of their existence in large numbers has been virtually forgotten. Within its fortress of expertise, the middle class imagines it is the sole repository of useful information even information about the lives of those who dwell outside the moats. 
Recall the sociology text that commented that the working class person often fails to realize that his story is neither understandable nor interesting to the other person. A sociology textbook said that? Wow. The most ubiquitous one-way channel of communication between the classes is television. By the 60s, most Americans, including the poorest, had been drawn into the homogenous national culture created by network television. There they encountered many kinds of people, including black power advocates, student protesters, and experts commenting on movements and social trends. But they definitely did not encounter people like themselves. In the land of the media, whether it is movies, magazines, or TV, Floyd Smith, president of the International Association of Machinists, told Time in 1970, Daddy always goes to the office, not to the factory. Network executives, you will recall, acknowledged having completely forgotten the working class majority. Its activism, the upsurge of strikes and militant job actions in the late 60s, was scantily covered relative to the movements of students or minorities and was never framed as a crisis, a challenging new phenomenon with its own media heroes and personalities. <clears throat> For example, Times' 1970 article on the blue-collar labor insurgency featured none of the individual insurgents. Only one of the accompanying photos showed actual strikers, and none of them were identified by name. The other photos, hard hats marching on Wall Street, Charlie Chaplin in Modern Times, and a poster for the movie Joe, illustrated the stereotype, but had nothing to do with the story. In fact, in the 60s, it was hard to find a blue-collar worker in the media at all. By the way, I want to point out that the closest you'll actually find to blue-collar representation today is... Uh, Minions. I know that's pretty, that's pretty bad, but it's true. <laughs> what are they? They're little workers. And it was so demeaning when I was working at Amazon and the little Amazonian figure cartoon that they use looks like a fucking min minion. And uh, if you do a really good job, they come and they give you a pin and it's like this little smiling minion that you can like wear as flair. Ugh. And all the managers have like vests just covered in this flare. It's, it's flare just like in the movie Office Space, uh, except that there's no requirement that you wear a certain amount or anything like that. It's just like, but obviously it is implied that if you're proud to be an Amazonian, if you're eager to be a part of the team, then of course you'll wear a lot of this flare and make this weird identification with the cringiest cartoon characters in the world, minions. Okay, and I mean, they're, they're funny. I, I don't mean to, to hate or anything like that. It's, but it's, I'm just saying, yeah, that's, that kind of cartoon is the closest you'll really get to mainstream representation. In fact, in the 60s, it was hard to find a blue-collar worker in the media at all. A report titled Work in America, commissioned by the federal government in 1971, observed, quote, Today, there is virtually no accurate dramatic representation, as there were in the 1930s, of men and women in working class occupations. Research shows that less than one character in 10 on television is a blue collar worker, and these few are usually portrayed as crude people with undesirable social traits. Furthermore, portrayals tend to emphasize class stereotypes. Lawyers are clever, while construction workers are louts. So on the eve of their discovery, the working class... And, and by the way, when I think of lawyers are clever while working, while construction workers are louts, I think of the... I think of Biden poking that hard hat wearing guy in the chest at the, uh, the auto factory uh, in Detroit. Remember, he, I mean, he was asking some like basic right-wing framed questions about guns but yeah, the, how you respond to those questions says more than those questions themselves. If your response is, ah, oh, shut the fuck up, bucko, listen here, you know your place, poke, 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 which was the kind of approach Biden took with the dude. Um, I think that creates more resentment than anything Tucker Carlson is capable of doing. So on the eve of their discovery, 
the working class majority found on their screens a dramatic new image of the American polity. People were jumping up and down, as it were, with their grievances, their visions, their demands for a better world or a fair share. But never people like us. In Robert Coles's study, the working class responses fairly ache with a sense of exclusion and neglect. A fireman's wife told him, The world hears those demonstrators making their noise. The world doesn't hear me and doesn't hear a single person I know. And a gas station owner's wife's Oh, wait, sorry. <clears throat> Doesn't hear a single person I know. And a gas station owner's wife said ruefully, quote, If you're a student at a fancy college, then anything you say, the television people are there to take it all down. They put those doped up hippies and radicals on the screen every other night. Maybe it's our fault. We don't want the attention. Maybe if we talked more, we'd get the attention. But who wants it? End quote. Perhaps most important, television was a new channel through which middle-class professionals could address the working class. At work, they gave orders. In schools and social agencies, they judged and condescended. Now, here they were in one's own home as televised commentators and experts, scolding, moralizing, carping. As John, a Polish-American machinist, explained, quote, I turn on that television we've got, and it's better than a comedy show. The way they speak on those talk shows, the announcer with his phony English accent, and the things they say, it makes you want to go and smash the damn set. They're full of long lectures, and they're always reconsidering something. There are times when I completely agree with them, but it's their attitude that gets you. They're conceited. End quote. Obviously, there's a lot to be said here about uh, classic American anti-intellectualism and how for the blue collar and lower working class um, its resentment uh, can be translated or articulated in these sort of anti-intellectual scripts uh, and uh, there's also better ways to translate it, right? There's ways that can translate it into an actual class consciousness, but um, when PMC professors who are radical see that this resentment exists and they run the other way instead of finding a productive way of helping cultivate that into a broader class consciousness, I think it only fosters more anti-intellectualism. It doesn't do anything to help the situation. Obviously, for me and for Elton L.K., who will also be lecturing tonight, we want a working class intelligentsia and we want a working class that's more open minded about intellectual things because being conceptually deprived is a genuine form of oppression. Not having concepts for making sense of yourself or the world that sucks. Speaking from personal experience, as someone who worked a lot of entry level backbreaking labor jobs before college and even through college and after college. I mean, I've been doing it the whole time. Um, I had never read nonfiction really in any serious way prior to the age of 23. And so, yeah, when I finally started getting concepts through philosophy and theory, um, it feels like liberation right? Oh, there's a word for that, right? It, it feels like entire like knots of thoughts that kind of go and then they, they get all twisted up. Like they get fleshed out and they get straightened out and they, and then you, you're, oh my God, you're able to, 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 to feel relieved and, and to actually see and think about things in a new way that breaks you out of ruts you'd been in for, you know, years. And so, um, I, not everybody needs it, right? I mean, maybe, maybe not everybody needs it, but uh, people of my disposition at least certainly do. It was a mystery to many middle-class observers why so much antagonism identified with the backlash was directed at the media. Spyro Agnew targeted the media for some of his most vicious attacks, as have right-wing populists ever since. 
It was not that the media had become too liberal or that people inevitably shoot the bearer of bad news. What media leaders could not see as they organized over the alienation of middle America was that the bearer in this case was himself bad news. He looked like a conceited professor or worse, like management. Only in this case, you could not, only in this case, only in this case, you could not even risk 25 cents an hour for the satisfaction of talking back. There is no talking back to TV. You can shout at the screen like the frustrated viewer quoted above or like Travis Bickle of Taxi Driver, you can kick it over. And I'll say a few things about social media, uh, probably a little bit more afterwards, but just for right now, I'll just say that critical theorists were keen on this point that TV is one directional. And because that was a, a thought or a line of critique of that form of media, some people were very hopeful for social media and the internet. And obviously there's a lot of rich possibilities in what we could potentially do with the internet, but I don't think it changes too much in a sense. Obviously there's the factor that people are algorithmically siloed, that you get looped into things through uh, statistical, demographical information that uses targeted advertising, blah de blah de blah. blah. Um, but more important, insofar as the PMC takes itself to be this neutral entity, this kind of natural, neutral standpoint that everyone else is just some deviation from, that it takes for granted, that still exists on social media. And I was thinking about how uh, the poet and self-help guru, young Pablo, who amassed millions of followers making daily Instagram posts, is a good example of this. If you watch him in interviews, he will talk about how our generation is coming to an understanding of what it means to let go. First, we had to come to an understanding of what it means to be yourself. But now we have to come to an understanding of what it means to let go. And he's talking about how we, our generation, we've been in this conversation on Instagram for the last five years. And we've gone through these transformations. And he's using this we, 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 we statements to talk about people who are primarily college students. He is not talking about regular working class Americans. He is talking about important things, but he's talking about it as though like that stereotype of Hegelian world spirit has gone through these stages of consciousness recently. And it's like, you're talking about your peer group and potentially about your class. So we still see it online. She's just talking about TV because I think this was written back in the 80s or something like that. At the time of its discovery, few mainstream middle-class commentators could imagine the real sources of working class hostility. The easy explanation and the one dictated by the blue collar stereotype was that the working class was hostile to middle class liberalism and the easy solution was to become less liberal. This is still today, I'm, I'm interjecting here, this is still today I think a part of the cycle. Every time, whether it's Occupy or Bernie or anything like that, uh, whether it's uh, BLM, wh whatever it is, Something starts out because of mass disenfranchisement and discontent, mass resentment. People mobilize. They want to see some change. And you have a bunch of PMC spokespeople take the helm. And then as things fizzle out, those and as those people's scripts and rhetoric and approaches 
further fracture and alienate the people who'd been there in the beginning. Um, the easy explanation, coming back to what she had just said, the easy explanation and the one dictated by the blue, the blue collar stereotype was that the working class was hostile to middle class liberalism and the easy solution was to become less liberal. This is always the solution after a mass movement is, okay, well really the problem was liberalism. And then obviously there's problems with liberalism, but the, the problem with liberalism that they will pick out is, well, why are we even trying to appeal to these people in the first place? Why are we trying to do things democratic in the first place? Why are we trying to even make these people feel represented in the first place? I mean, fuck, they're a bunch of deplorables. Fuck them. We should just insult them, honestly. So like you have the technocrats kind of bunker down and just become less liberal in like this kind of, uh, it's, it's also its own kind of resentment. This was the direction in which many erstwhile liberal intellectuals repelled by the student movement were already heading. The stereotype of the reactionary authoritarian blue collar worker helped legitimate their rightward, their rightward drift. And since the stereotype was a middle-class creation, this was also, in a sense, its function, to provide a spiritual touchstone for an emerging middle-class con conservatism and a cultural home for the traditional values of the middle class. You have to think that she's, she's doing this at a time where neoliberal was not yet a buzzword. I think that's very important here. But what she is describing is, uh, is part and parcel to what people later on are trying to talk about when they use the term neoliberal. But if anything, working class anger should be shown that, but if anything, working class anger should have shown that middle class liberalism had not gone far enough. It had been shaped by the discovery of poverty and defined by a concern for the poor, usually imagined as a tiny minority huddled in their pockets of poverty. The middle class liberal imagination had not anticipated the possibility that huge numbers of people, in many respects thoroughly ordinary, were also in some sense deprived, neglected, and downtrodden. It was, it was one thing to talk about equality and social change in relation to a minority. Quite another to imagine reform on the scale of the American majority. Middle class liberalism began to fall back in confusion. It was simply not up to the challenge. But the fact that the working class was discovered in a mood of acute hostility had one clear psychic consequence for the middle class as a whole. Liberal, conservative, or uncertain, it could no longer imagine itself as the core of the great American majority. It could no longer pretend to represent the universal welfare the universal perspective. Here was the true majority, the existence of which had been barely suspected, and it was an angry, embittered majority, hostile, apparently above all, to the middle class itself. In discovering the working class, the middle class discovered a negative and hideously unflattering image of itself, an isolated elite, pretentiously liberal and despised by authentic, hardworking Americans. Finished. That's the end of that excerpt. I really look forward to seeing what Elton will be doing with this. But for now, I think I'm going to leave off on a couple of closing statements. And so if you've been watching this live, go ahead and get into the comment section. If you are watching this after the fact, go ahead and get into the comment section. I will be sharing this from my wall at theoryunderground.com where I am going to begin sharing things almost like it's my personal Facebook or MySpace or something like that, right? I'm going to actually pull it up here in front of you all and show you what I'm talking about when I say my wall. Let's, let's uncrop the sides of this. Okay. Can you all see that? See what's going on over here? So let's see. 
Uh, this is not good. I can't actually see what I'm working with. Uh, website, are you okay? Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. Forums. So if we go to forums, if you go to theory-underground.com and then go to forums, you be able to scroll down and you can see that uh, Mikey teaches for they know not what they do, professional managerial class consciousness, and the idea of the university cohort are three of the forums that currently exist. These three forums require um, taking the course that is attached to those forums because the goal is to have conversations that are based in a shared uh, set of readings. I mean, like, that's something that academia was supposed to solve. You go to a conference and you expect that everybody's done the readings, but <sighs> anyway, so right here, though, is an open slash public forum. It's called public slash open forums, FAQ, meme stash, etc. If you go there, that's the forum that you do not have to take a course to enter. It is open to the public. You can introduce yourself, report technical problems, bugs, errors, etc. Because I'm trying to build this website. And so if you're seeing problems, go ahead and take screenshots and help help me see what you're seeing so I can talk to technical support and get it all worked out. Um, and yeah, if you were to say, click on my name here, it will take you to my, my profile. You can click on my timeline. This is where you can add me as a connection on the site. Um, and you can read my status updates. Obviously, I'm still on social media like Instagram and stuff like that, but this is going to become my go-to from which I then share some of the things to other social media. And uh, you can create, when you register with the site and you take a course or join the forum or whatever like that, you can set up your profile picture and your cover photo. I highly recommend that you at the bare minimum set up your profile picture because if there's no profile picture, it's really weird. It's, it's almost like you're showing up to a meeting or a lecture or someone's house wearing a ski mask. That might be okay out on the wild, wild west of Reddit or Twitter. But this site is going to be built primarily over the next year and a half that will include some countrywide tours in the United States and abroad. And so it's going to be slow building at first. There's a few people who are really invested, who are friends of mine who have met in real life or who have come to my work through the YouTube channel. But there's going to be a lot of new people who come in through first meeting myself and Anne face-to-face. -face. I'll be selling some Theory Underground books of my own and at least of Michael Downs, probably a couple of his books this year. And so what am I trying to say? Get involved. Register with the website. Make sure to check your spam fo uh, folder for the verification email when you register. Um, if it doesn't even show up there, then you just have to have the website resend it, and then you should be in. Set up your profile picture, uh, post what's on your mind, and uh, if you have questions, comments, concerns, ideas, things you want to share, articles, whatever, that you're thinking about and wanting to dialogue with others who might be interested in similar things and you are already into this kind of stuff, then this is where to do it because I'm trying to build this instead of a Discord. Seems like every creator nowadays uses Discord. I tried, it was driving me crazy, and so this is what we got. Secret Asian Dan quotes me saying, website, are you okay? And says, he treats object like people. Yeah, uh, that's true. I do. I talk to objects like people all the time. The question is, do I, pe do, do I treat people like objects? I hope not. 
But yeah, I talk to this website. I argue with this website as I'm trying to problem solve it. There's all kinds of problems that I've been able to solve thanks to the help of people like Nick and Nance and Mikey and Anne. Thank you to all of you for helping me troubleshooting this platform. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, this is it. I've officially read it aloud. Now, if you want a refresher for the excerpt that Elton will be lecturing on tonight, here it is. You can enjoy. And then the closing thing that I have to say um, is that money exists. Um, because money exists and things cost it, and I'm not I'm currently unemployed for the first time in a long time without any plans of going back to any kind of regular wage labor anytime soon. You can support theory-underground.com forward slash support is where you can make um, the $50 donation or you can purchase a class or purchase a book. And then if you want to make a variable amount donation, a, a, to kind of choose your own number, then you can always uh, use PayPal for theoryplebe at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-O-R-Y-P-L-E-E-B at gmail.com. And I think that's all I got to say, folks. So thank you for tuning in. I'm looking forward to doing a lot more of these exegetical audiobook excerpts in the near future. And uh, for now... I'm going to close out by playing this testimonial video from our good friend, Bert. So let's do that. Now you can see what OBS looks like. That's what it looks like. And uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw that poster. Bold real art in Boise fucking Idaho. Are you kidding me? It was virtually an, an answer to an unspoken prayer, you know, it really was. And I just couldn't believe that somebody was interested in the things that I was interested in, that I had been interested in for years and had kind of given up on in, in futility. I'd labored in solitude for so long, I had no one to talk to about it, no one to bounce ideas off of. It, it just vastly accelerated my ability to, I don't get too philosophical here, to interrogate, to inquire, and to see connections between things. And so the theory underground that Dave is developing in this mission is, is trying to reach an audience of people who aren't just doing philosophy in a university setting. Why is there an advantage to doing philosophy outside of an academic right. setting? Well, the neat thing is that you can really drill down. You know, when you're in school, you know, you don't, you have to do 50 things, and you do them all partially. And uh, it's like you're digging a well. And you're digging very shallow wells. When you can drill down deep and take your time and really get into something, especially with a company of fellows that you get into the slipstream of, of a great philosopher and you just have to take the deep dive. Uh, but initially, a lot of these philosophers, they're speaking to a tradition, they're trying to resolve specific problems, and they just assume you know what those are, that you've had their life experience. So the first time you read read them, you're, you're just trying to get the lay of the land. And you may well uh, have some uh, insights. You may wrongly associate certain things you know with what they're saying. But um, then you'll maybe like look at a secondary text. And now, oh, since you have something to bring to the table, all the lights start going off. And then when you read the philosopher the second time, you can read them more knowledgeably. And so you're really you're looking for things you're better able to follow along. Uh, you're not left behind so much. Uh, the third reading, though, and it's these are for profound books. 
I mean, you don't have to read everything like this. But for a, a profound text, the third reading is where you've learned enough that you relate it to everything else you know, that you begin to see the connectedness between what this philosopher is doing and the, uh, the implicit, unstated um, situation that they were speaking to initially, you know something about that. And you see the connection between that and all sorts of other things. And you connect it to your life and the way you live and move through the world and the, the way you see things and interact with people. And you, you are not just absorbing, you're creating. You're a co-creator. When it's all said and done, you just have to put it into your own words. And there's a danger of reductionism there. But when you put it into your own words and you're bringing all these different strands together, it's really phenomenal. And that's what the third reading does. So, a few years ago, Dave, running you through the channel, had a Patreon going and right. discontinued accepting money from people. But since then, you have continued to make a donation monthly. And right. It's obviously very meaningful to Dave, meaningful to me as well, being Dave's partner. Right. And so, why? Why, why do you do that, <laughs> essentially? Well, Dave brings people together. Whatever Dave is doing is valuable. And uh, my life was completely changed. And I'm grateful. I can't afford to give Dave 50 bucks a month, but I do because it brings me joy. Every, every time I get my social security, the first thing I do is send $50 to Dave. And uh, my heart sings. And it's a sense of gratitude. I don't feel obligated to do it. I want to do it. And I want to do whatever I can to help Dave do for other people what he did for me. And I want uh, that to continue. And it's uh, truly, I take great joy in it. It's the best $50 I spend a month. It really is. Like if you can plant a seed where uh, a handful of people meet each other and they can all have the experience that we've had face-to-face mm -hmm. um, -face mm -hmm. with each other, that would be awesome. Cool. Last thing I'm going to say here. Uh, I know I keep saying last thing, last thing, last thing. But uh, tonight, on this channel, you will be able to see the lecture that I'm giving and the lecture that Elton is giving live. So that will be, let's see, what time will that be, folks? Ooh, 8 p.m. if you're on the East Coast, 5 p.m. if you're on the West Coast, 6 p.m. if you are in Boise, 7 p.m. if you are near Chicago or it's time zone. So um, the stream coming up tonight, the link for it, it's right here. I'll share that in the comment section below. Elton will be bringing in key sections from Taylor's Scientific Management, published in 1911. Charles Taylor's, is it Charles Taylor? Whatever. Whoever tailors scientific management, the principles of scientific management is a famous, famous work in business and capitalist like management and uh, really changed the game for factory production. Cool. All right, everybody. Take care. Have a good rest of your day.